Which, by the way, thanks for being here. This is really cool. All right, Charlie, let's get it rolling, man. All right. One of the reasons that I really wanted to do this with you is because we have those meetings at the Starbucks. I, maybe I shouldn't say your place because people will swarm you, but the place where we go to meet um, and have our one-on-one -on -one chats and, and throughout the course of those, I always thought, we should have these conversations mm -hmm. recorded mm -hmm. based upon all of the knowledge that you're sharing with me, the wisdom I'm gaining from you, from everything that you've learned. So that's why I really want to do this and I appreciate uh, you joining pleasure. me. Yeah. And I, I'm curious, so to get us going, as you know, because uh, I appreciate you being a fan and listener of the show, I love learning from people who have been around fantastic leaders, who have studied leadership, guys like you who exhibit the qualities themselves people who sustain excellence specifically, as you know mm -hmm. I care about that. And I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, what are the commonalities you found in those people who have sustained excellence over an extended period of time? Well, I've had some tremendous mentors. Uh, you don't last long in leadership without people who are ahead of you. And the two that stand out to me, uh, Bob Russell and Gary Sweeten, Dr. Gary Sweeten, very integrated individuals they're not disintegrated. In other words, they're not chasing a bunch of different things. They don't have a bunch of different motives. Their motives are consolidated and coalesced toward a particular self-mission. And for me, that has been incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in a ministry position, you get all these opportunities to do all these different things, right? You, you, get, you get, you know, hey, Charlie, can we have coffee? I've got an opportunity for you. And uh, my personal mission statement of I exist to bring heaven to earth by serving my family, growing the local church, and participating in athletics has been incredibly integrating for me. So it keeps me, when there's this opportunity to do this money-making thing, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, I've always felt like I, that would distract me. And I've, my focus has always been on Dayton, really, since I've been here. War Warren Buffett said the difference between people who are great and really great is the ability to say no. I'm feeling like that's what you mean when you say integrated because I would imagine you get bombarded constantly. I know you don't say that, you don't brag about that, and I'm texting you and you always respond and you wanna meet, and mm -hmm. I'm very appreciative, but I gotta imagine that there's always ideas or things that people want you to be involved with based on your leadership over the years. Well, there are, and, and it goes back to, I think we were gonna talk a little bit about family, but I chose, my dad was gone 25 days a month. Really? Wow. And I loved him and everything, but I didn't have enough of him. And I was never going to do that. So the, the result of that was it was a real easy thing for me to say no to traveling. I just, that wasn't going to be my focus, my career. I think I had the gifts to be able to do that. But the combination of that, I wanted to be focused on a local community and a local church. It happened to end up being Dayton in 1992. And then I don't want to be a dad who's absent. It, it really integrated my life. What did your dad do? He was an electronic engineer by trade. Okay. Um, very bizarre. I, he, I thought he was a teacher. I, don't let this out of this room. <laughs> but I found out after I was married, he worked for the CIA. He worked for the government. Wait, are, you, are you serious? I'm serious. <laughs> and I, and I, and even to the, I remember when he, told, when he told me that. I remember he took, I don't know, my parents' property. He took my wife and I out to like the back 40. And uh, he said, I got to tell you something. And it's still to this day is bizarre. Yeah. It was the Technovate in Florida. I probably shouldn't say the company name. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> whoops, uh, selling yeah. government secrets. Uh, he, yeah, it was a, it was a covert company, and and it was it, he was gone. I remember I remember that's why he had to take off when the Challenger exploded. Really? Like he had to take off. Like he, we were literally. I remember I was on break from, and I was in school then, finishing up school, and we had to take break, and he, boom, he took off. Really. And then you know he told us that that's that's why so he was gone and and then you can imagine an individual like that my dad was really fascinating he was half apache half irish raised in southwest texas graduated from high school at 16. i mean just a yeah. tremendous football player uh my love of football came from my dad who ended up coaching and but i didn't get enough of it yeah i, I didn't get enough of it yeah and i mean we reconciled that and everything before he died, but it really helped me integrate my life to say, I'm not, that's, and I would do that again. You know, I would, yeah. I would, I would do that over again. I wouldn't, I wouldn't are, do, do it differently. Are, are you overly communicative with your kids about that? Do you tell those stories to them and say, this is why I'm choosing? Because you, I mean, you have the talent, 
to be one of the guys that travels, that's on TV. That you really do. You know that. I think you've probably been told that all the time. And uh, but you've just you've decided not to do that. So do you guys have those those conscious meetings as a family to say, look, I feel like I probably could, and you could probably make a lot of money. I don't know how that mm -hmm. business works. Mm -hmm. You do, but you've decided to grow it here instead. Is, are, is that a family? You know, it, we never really talked about it much. We my my like I say, my main mentor Bob Russell, who served a church in, for 40 years in Louisville, Kentucky. He 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 conditioned me on don't spend money on stuff spend money on events together yep. Yep. and so they just naturally our kids naturally go like I, I, we were just talking earlier this is our 21st straight year in Hilton Head and mm -hmm. the whole point of we picked that because we wanted to have a place that our kids basically grew up and now our two grandsons are on the beach with us mm -hmm. and and that was like okay we messed up in so many ways as parents like all parents do we got that one right yeah <laughs> we yeah. got that one right you know yeah yeah um one of the fascinating parts about the meetings that you and I have on those Tuesdays at Starbucks is uh, I am a uh, fascinated by process and specifically about how people put great things together. Mm -hmm. And when I see you perform, and I call it, I think it's a performance, when I see you perform on stage every week, uh, I'm, I'm blown away by how you're able to do it and it's different every week. Meaning the message is not like you get up there and right, just read right. out of a book. You're, that's a small part of it, but you're doing it. And so I love for you to describe that process of you, how do you put together the sermon, the speech, the performance mm -hmm. every single week? Because I, I, I remember saying you probably just have a bank of stuff and you just boop, pull it My out of the bank, say pull it sermon. out of the bank. They say it's sermons.com. It is not. It's yeah. not sermons.com. Right. You write, yeah. the, you write them right. fresh every yeah. week, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I'd just love for you to expand on that well, process. Well, it's funny you use the word performance because I look at it that way. The yeah. word entertainment means to hold attention. So you say, ah, you know, churches shouldn't entertain. Do you want to hold people's attention? Because that's, what, that's why Jesus told parables is because it held people's attention, right? And so for me, I have a very distinct process that I use teaser, tension, truth, take home, and together. Can you say that again? Teaser. So the teaser is something that just grabs you. So last week, we were in a series where I'm talking about sex, and usually it's something from the, the news that I'll use, or my own life, that is funny or engaging. So I use the example of anybody, anybody seeing any pictures of lava coming down mountains right now? Because that's the power of sexual energy. Mm -hmm. When it goes beyond its boundaries, it can really destroy. Well, that's a different way to look at it, right? That's a teaser. And then the tension is the inductive part of speaking that you have to do today. You have to build the tension so that the listeners say, this is important. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that real early in the message, people check out. Like literally people leave. I mean, it's just amazing. Like they'll literally get up and that is, isn't for me. And, and then, you know, the truth is the part of it where you say, okay, for like for me in my position, this is what scripture has to say about this issue. The take home is then what's the practical do? What's, what, is the, what is something you can do or two or three things you can do? And then the together is I always try to end on, it, aren't, isn't this the kind of person we want to be? We, you always try to end on we, like we're, don't, don't we want to be, I mean, you remember this, like you could go back on messages because you're a, I tell people that Ryan and my son Austin are my two biggest fans, you know, <laughs> but because you analyze that stuff. Right. That it almost always ends on, isn't this, it, doesn't your heart yearn to be this kind of person? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be amazing if we were all this way? Yeah. You know, and uh, so I have a very distinctive process. Most preachers were trained to go deductive. And that would be truth, take home, together maybe, but usually truth and take home. You hmm. can't do that now. It has to be inductive, where you draw the listener into, they draw their own conclusion, because that's how people really learn, is when they, run, they learn on their own conclusion. Mm -hmm. And then once you sense that, people go, okay. And, I, and now I can sense the lean in. I can sense when there's the, let my people go, you know, mm -hmm. or leaning into, wow, this is really relevant to my life. I. Um but the part that is new, so how do you decide, not necessarily the message, because I know there's, there's, there's themes and you have mm -hmm. it planned out for a while in advance, say, mm -hmm. okay, like in June we're doing this, in May we did this, in March, and even probably the next six months mm -hmm. or so. But when you weave in current events, current and new research, 
you you are studying the same people that I interview on my podcast. Yeah, I've yeah. heard you say their names, yeah, yeah. their books, their speeches. You reference that work. That's all. A lot of it's new. So you're bringing in new uh, research with old stories, and then finding a way to weave it together. What is that process like? How do you put that together? Well, I told you we've talked about this. the 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 best description of this is the Medici Effect book by Franz Johansson, where he talks about the, the Renaissance happened because seemingly disconnected entities were connected. Yep. And so he uses the example in that book of scientists who took a certain kind of goat's milk and mixed it basically with a certain kind of spider's web and created this incredible linen, this silk. Mm -hmm. Architects in sub-Saharan Africa learned from ants who created these tunnels that allowed water to flow through the tunnels and then air and they stayed at constant 72 degrees in sub-Saharan Africa and architects designed buildings in sub-Saharan Africa without air conditioning that stayed at 72 degrees and and it was all <laughs> modeled off ants so ants and buildings what do they have in common and so that's what I do all the time so I'm always like my brain is always what does this volcano story have to do with sex. Wow, that's not a hard one. Anybody can you know, see that one, the, the, the hot lava kind of thing. <laughs> not to embarrass our audience here, but uh, uh, you know, so there, I'm always doing that. You know, we did that, that, probably the most impactful series in my 26 years we've ever done was that stress series that we did. Yeah, I got it, Mark. Where, you know, uh, the, the upside of stress book that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And one day I saw a quote that emotions are like waves. You can't choose which ones come, but you can choose which ones you're gonna ride, and it hit me. That's what stress is. It, it, it's waves that come your way, and so we did the stress breakers. Like, you, you learn to ride the wave of stress, and that's what her research showed, that if you choose to embrace stress, it has a positive effect on your body. But if you stand there on the shore of stress and you say, hit me stress, I hate you, It'll hurt you. It'll, <laughs> it'll, you know, you'll be digging sand out of your swimsuit here, you know? And uh, so I'm always looking for those intersections. Yeah. You know? How do you, is it just a lot of practice from weaving metaphors and creating them? Because that's what, to me, I remember stories. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, like in my own speaking, it's thinking, okay, here's the point we want to get across. What story comes up with that? And my whole, my favorite process of books too and speaking is, Story, science, story, science, yeah. story, yeah, right. science. Because I remember the story right. and then the science kind of comes along it with does. it. And then when you create metaphors, it really hammers it home. It does, home. that's right. You know? It validates it. Well, and, and you know, the, for me, it's, it's a habit of looking at life. Like so people say, how long did that take you for, to put that message together? Oh, about 30 hours in a lifetime. <laughs> you know, about, about every one is that way. You know, some of them yeah. are less. But that whole sermon series on stress breakers, I, that was a year in the making. Hmm. You know, you, I was, it started a year and a half before that when, uh, when I read the book and, and then, you know, just watching my own life. Because I read that because I wanted to see stress differently in my own life. Mm -hmm. Which is, by the way, one of the great intersections. And you, I know you read Charles Duhigg's Smarter, Faster, Better. Yeah, talk to him. The chapter yeah. on the production of Frozen yep. and West Side Story. Uh, I had our creative team reading it. I said, read this book. I got them copies of the book. I said, read this book, but go straight to, I think it's chapter seven. Go straight to chapter seven because Frozen was a very mediocre production until they had the screenwriters intersect that story of the two sisters with their own story. And that's where it really comes to life. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you've heard me say I'm very... I'm, I'm very open about nearly losing our two children mm -hmm. who really, they will tell you, they were, they, were, they were raised in a very, I'll even say it, idyllic situation with friends and family, but um, depression runs in our family line and hit both of them. And so I'm open about that. And that intersection, when you take that intersection of that reality, and then you make an application to people's lives, you have listeners. You have people who... Uh, and especially in the church, because people aren't used to authenticity in the church. They're, they're just, you know, yeah. they're just you not think, used to that. What's the challenge of being the, the, the son or daughter of somebody like you? Uh, you're, uh, a, a, a well, yeah. you know, a, a well-known, uh, high-performing, 
uh, guy who's grown a church, who's had an immense success right over the course of your life, both in athletics and then you know what you're doing now, obviously over mm -hmm. many years. What do you? I, I'm curious about those conversations because right, you, you you're open about this. It's about, you know in the you know, last few years, as you know, they've yeah. become very open about how hard it was. Right. We we thought we started such a different church. Yeah. That we thought our kids are going to be different. They're not going to be the typical preacher's kids that have all this pressure because nobody's going to know who they are. Well, enough people knew who they were yep. to know that they had pressure on them. And I didn't, I didn't, Sherry and I, neither one appreciated the pressure that was on them. But that's true. I have friends whose dads started and built successful businesses and their children experienced, it's called the famous father syndrome. Like, I'll never measure up. So they choose to, in psychological terms, differentiate because I can't win that game. I am, I'm not going to play a game I know I can't win, so I'm going to differentiate. Well, Austin and Jordan had to do that. And we've, we've told that story. You, I don't know if you guys heard her on Mother's Day. It was incredible. It was one of the most impactful weekends we ever had. Is our daughter told her story mm -hmm. of falling into eating disorder. And that is just so rare for people to hear that mm -hmm. in a church, right, where there's such a plasticity. Mm -hmm. that can take over. What advice do you give to people now? Let's say they have kids who are maybe my, my kid's age, and I'm curious to say whatever levels of success their parents have. I talk about this with AJ all the time, right? We, we, mm -hmm. you, they're going to Google you and see that you've made $50 million or more in your life. Like, how do we like, how do, we do a good job? Yeah, like, well, it's, the it's, girl, you know, your girls will be proud of you. Yeah. They will love you. You can tell by the way they look at you they do. And when you walk into the room, the temperature will go up for them. Yeah. Because you and Miranda are very capable people. Yeah. And that's not bad. Yeah. Kids, we don't need to worry that kids need to be stress-free. Kids need stress just like we do to grow. You, you, the stress-free life is the dying life, actually. Yeah. But what I wish I'd have been aware of is, is, the, is the temperature went in the room, went up in the room significantly for my kids when I walked in and that's what they were always living within and so that same heat within me that that drove me burned them hmm. I didn't know it it's you know like most parenting things you learn five minutes too late do you ever you know that <laughs> you do you just like more than oh, five why minutes didn't I know, why didn't I know that five minutes ago you know? <laughs> and but I think that's true for us that's why now that we've developed that system of play yep. personality type learning style ability level and yes factor and why I'm giving my life to redeem our story, to tell student athletes, artists, and academics that you don't have to cave under the pressure. You mm -hmm. don't have to. It doesn't have to destroy you. Yeah. There's a way for you to, to perform in a healthy way. Yeah. And so that's, what, that's predominantly what I'm doing right now. Yeah. A another interesting part of your story that I l would love to go deeper in is the fact that I went to Southbrook when it was, there may, it might have been 50 people in the mm -hmm. room or less, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a different building, mm -hmm. and it was small, and you were the same guy, and now you get how many people a weekend? Oh, uh, you know what? We, we average about 5,000 people right, a 5, weekend. Right, 5,000, yeah. so 50 mm -hmm. to 5,000. You um, are, are a huge reason, I know you're going to give credit to everybody else, but you're a huge reason for that growth from where you were to where you are now and there's a lot of listeners who are trying to build their own tribe in some way shape or form whether it's they're an entrepreneur they're the ceo of a company they're a mid-level manager an individual contributor whatever it is they're trying to grow their own tribe what when they come to you what would you say if you looked back and say you know what we did this well we did this well mm -hmm. we did this well and if i were you i would try to do the same thing as far as building a uh, and, uh, uh, from basically from nothing or very small mm -hmm. to, 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 to pretty, pretty well, sizable. Uh, you know, my mentor taught me that if you, if you do a circus on Sundays, but you do it excellently, people will come. <laughs> yeah. And we have felt like a circus sometimes, <laughs> so that fits real well. And I do believe that. I believe that there has to be a commitment to excellence that is you. You can't fake that. You can't, you can't be someone that does not desire excellence in every area of your life and then and then, oh, but we're going to make our entity, our organization, excellent. It, it, I think Aristotle said it is, it is a habit, right? Mm -hmm. Excellence is a habit. So for me, the commitment to excellence that is dangerous because it easily becomes perfectionism. And the difference between excellence and perfectionism is excellence is expressing my worth and ennobling others by saying I care. Perfectionism is trying to earn my worth 
hmm. by being perfect. And trust me, I've gone over that line many times what in you, many can ways. You, can, you, can you expand on that? So perfectionism is I've got to be perfect or I'm not worth anything. Yeah. And I'm a perfectionist. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, uh, it's by nature I am. And, and so many of us as leaders start out that way. And yeah. then, you know, my motto today is maturity is way underrated because now I'm actually, I believe, more excellent in what I do because it's not as compulsive. Excellence comes out of a peace and it's actually, I don't think there really is excellence without a sense of peace because you can create things that are really high functioning but there's such chaos attached to them that that's not excellent because in excellence the process is as much important as the product. Mm -hmm. So the, for me, the perfectionism, especially early on, was I, I remember days when I would, you know, I don't use a manuscript when I teach, but I do write one out and, and basically memorize it. And my wife would laugh at me because I couldn't have grammatical errors on the manuscript that nobody would see, including me. <laughs> Okay, now that's compulsive. <laughs> that is, yeah. That's a little weird, okay? I hope we don't lose our audience over that. That's a little weird. And, uh, and so that's who I am, and then maturity brings that more into a, and I think it's self-actualization to a great extent. You, you, you don't, I don't feel the need to prove stuff as much. And so now I'm able to let excellence, excellence is the right people doing the right things for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. So that means you. That means you're doing the right things. Know what you're good at, know what you're not good at for the right reasons. Is it for validation or mm -hmm. is it for an expression that ennobles others? Mm -hmm. And in our case, God, it honors God. And then lastly, you know, the, for the right motivations are, are um, not so compulsive, like I say. And, uh, I, and one of the best, best compliments I've gotten recently is my, my mentor, my counselor, Gary, Dr. Gary Sweeten said, you're not as compulsive as you used to be, which was an interesting way to say it. He wasn't saying I wasn't compulsive at all. As it used to he was saying, you're not as compulsive as you used to be. I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm not what I was. And, and uh, we, we committed to excellence. We are far from being what I consider an excellent place. But I think a lot of people look at us and say, you guys do a lot of things excellently. Yeah. Were there, I would look at it as, we got a long way to go. Were yeah. there pivotal moments along the way that you remember in your mind, like that was a big deal, or that was a big deal because we went from this pretty small place to now 5,000. Yeah, you know, the cost of growth is yourself, your own time, talents, and treasures. And so the pivotal moments for us is anytime we build a place where more people could sit, yeah. that filled up. So those were all, like we, I could just map out 94, 96, 98, 2001, 2002. Those are all years where we exploded in growth and it was we created more seats. Yeah. You know, it's all about chairs, cars, and children when it comes to what we do. So do you, do you create places for people to sit? Do you have places for people to park? And do you have a place for their kids? Mm -hmm. And if you do those three things and you have a message uh, that is relevant, the birds will come back to the birdhouse where there's fresh food. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that's just the way it works. And uh, that's just true today. So those were all really pivotal moments. But we talked about this a while back. I don't know if you remember this, but I'm a huge believer in the constant burden of leadership is the constant interception of entropy. So for us, our church, we said we're going to reach the person who doesn't like church. Mm -hmm. So constantly there'll be people who like church, who come to our church, and they want the spirit of the place, but they want to change it hmm. and make it more churchy <laughs> <laughs> and the the for me the hardest thing has been 26 years of standing and saying no nope. throw a rock up in Dayton it's gonna come down on top of a church building first of all yeah okay so there are plenty of those it's yeah. great we need churches for church people but ours was going to be for that that SOB who thinks there's no hope for him yeah you know why did, you, why did you choose that route? Well, because I didn't like church. So that was a real problem to be a pastor and not like church. So yeah. we had to have something for people who don't like yeah, church yeah, yeah. because yeah. I didn't really care for it that much. I didn't want to be spending my Sunday mornings thinking, okay, it must be church because this is suffering. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't want to do that. I wanted something that, you know, I always said, just throw a Jesus party and people will come. So really, that's what we do. Like, if you, can't, you know, it's like, it's like a concert. Yeah. People go, this feels like a concert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what it is in... in you know, that's going back to the entertainment of it, right? You, you were, we're holding attention. Yeah. And 
the interception of the entropy, the, the constant gravitational full pull to become like everyone else, every organization that wants to do something unique faces that. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. What, the, part of uh, the thing that may be scary, you told a story months ago about uh, a bike wreck that could have mm -hmm. seriously been the end of mm -hmm. you. Uh, mm -hmm. It was close to a, over the handlebars or almost got hit by a car, whatever happened. Yeah. And I, I've said this, so, and I, I even said it publicly, maybe at Provoke a time or two, one of the main reasons, or maybe the main reason we go there is because of you. And if you weren't there, I, I don't love admitting this, but I'm not sure I would go. Mm -hmm. um, that's just how I, that's my truth. And so mm -hmm. how, I know that worries you and that concerns yeah, you. Every be day. Because, so how do you handle it? I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, maybe we, we compare this, this could be weird, but let me try something. What if it's like Elon Musk, right? And mm -hmm. he, he actually runs Tesla and SpaceX, and if he is no longer there, it could be, that's why he's not going up in his rockets, because if he's not there, it could hurt the mission. Yeah. There's, there's a little similarity there. Yeah. How do you handle that? Like, how do you? you well, I, you know, I've, I've, I've always had this incredible experience of the right people coming along at the right time. So I don't worry about it too much. On the other hand, I'm going on 57 years old. I've been doing this a long time. And I don't want to be told, leave. I don't. I do. I, if one, of, you know, one of my fears is you, you're just not very relevant anymore. You're not very effective. So I do. I, do. I genuinely fear that. It's not right. I just, I, that I do. So we're constantly in process of finding the people that our goal is, hey, when's Mac Mahan quitting? Because this guy's good. This gal's good, right? This gal's really good. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're constantly doing that. When you have been at a place a long time, Jim Collins is spot on. You also are in the way. So I, I'm living in this constant tension of, as I realize very much that when I speak, people come more. I know that. I, I, I understand that to some extent. I would do that too. I also know I'm in the way. Because when you've been someplace a long time, there becomes this, this unconscious, we won't move ahead of her or ahead of him. Hmm. And it's really weird. And that's what he, he termed the level five leader right. is key because the charismatic leader gets in the way of the organization eventually. Mm -hmm. And that's true of us. And I, I'm, I don't, because, oh, you're just being self-deprecating. No, it's true, I see it. I see where I'm in the way. So, I, 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 don't, I don't want to be done before 10 or 15 years, but I'm willing to be done whenever it feels like I'm not effective and I, I anymore and we you, have the right people. Yeah, I get the sense from you because I studied, obviously, Colin's work and others that I still check back and people that are on the team now are listening uh, with my team when I was a, a mid-level manager at LexisNexis. It's been probably five years and I still check a little bit, how are they doing? Mm -hmm. Like, how are they percent to plan? Are they still the number one team in the company? Mm -hmm. Like, it means a lot to Absolutely. me. And the turnover team has been, not completely, but the culture, I want that to be embedded because I think that is so important, is that I left it better, and I actually also left it that, it's not better than when I got there, but it's gonna be better and better and better because you got it set up properly. No question, that's a test of your leadership. Right. It's what happens after you leave the room, right. Right. the building, the organization, that's the yeah. test. And I'm curious, so we talk about tribe building, a lot of people wanna build tribes, it's a big deal, it's a buzzword now. If you had to relate that and you were talking to, because you, you consult with businesses too, I know mm -hmm. that's part of your work you do on the side, I don't know how mm -hmm. you fit all this in, but you do that too. What's the advice you give to people in the, in the private sector, not, not from, a, a, from building a church, but they're saying, we're trying to build our business, we wanna grow. What are some of the leadership principles that you instill in them? I know that's a broad term, yeah. but, but, but just overall. That's a good one, because Max Dupree really got me started on the tribal speak. Yep. What, what are your unique tribal speaks? We have, a, we have a gifts assessment that we developed called Play. And it's not the best one, but it's ours. Yep. You know, we developed it. Mm -hmm. And we have the five S's, you know, we talk, you hear me talk about that all the time, your whole life. If you build your life around, uh, you know, solitude, uh, scripture, service, support, and significant events, you can't help but grow as an individual. You can't mm -hmm. help. Well, you know, those are ours. I'm sure there are some like them. I'm sure there are more than five, but those are ours. So the tribal speak issue to build a tribe is huge. But tribe is where story and strategy meet. That's where you have a tribe. So leadership is where story and so can we embrace our stories 
And is there a strategy that is, starts with a mission that we have and we can all agree on? Now we have people dancing around the fire. You know, mm -hmm. my dad was Af uh, Native American, so I can say that. <laughs> uh, now we have a tribe because it is ultimately, you said it, our stories that connect us. Mm -hmm. And when you put a strategy to that, the people go, I believe in that. It's an accelerator of those stories unifying. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have synergy. You yeah. know? So for us, it's recovery. Our church, if you, if you peel the onion of South Park away, what you'll find in the middle is utter, utter brokenness brought to God. Because the core atom of our church are all of our people who started this that, that needed recovery. Hmm. You know? And that's why the church is so irreligious. Yeah. It's because it's not, it was, it's not led by religious people. It's led by broken people. Yeah. And that, that's just stories meeting strategy. That's all the, that's all the 12 steps are. Yeah. Our stories meeting strategy. Yeah. Right? Um, I, I love to... I'm always fascinated. This may be just me, but uh, I, I was hosting uh, six football coaches, and I asked this question, and uh, I think people thought maybe it was a dumb question, but then the answers were really cool. So I want to ask it to you. I asked them what they do right before game time. Like, what was there a big speech? What do the kids do in the locker room? And they all had these six <laughs> unique ways. There was one guy hires a DJ, other guys dance. Sometimes the coaches completely leave, and it just it was really fascinating. Yeah. People in the crowd were like, wow. I, what is it like the, the minute before you go on stage or the 30 seconds before you're about to go on stage? What's going through your mind? What's your thought process? Are you nervous? Or maybe you're not. I'm just fascinated by that. Aspect. Well, there's a couple things. Used to, it was panic. I mean, panic. Like, when I, like, I don't, it took me 10 years to get over the, what am I doing? 10 years? It was. It was a long time before I didn't have that feeling of, what do I think I'm doing <laughs> as I'm walking you up You mean there. like imposter syndrome that I don't belong here? Uh, or? Maybe a little bit. You know, I, I think it was more just, it's just so, it's pres leading is so presumptuous. Yeah, that's a good it, point. It is. Yeah, it just point. is. And, yeah. and I did come out of a shame-based, a very high achieving shame-based environment. So there was always that. What, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, my dad was very an overcomer. So he overcame so much. And there was always that in my mind, am I ever going to measure up to that? I mean, he was a 20-year military guy on top of, did I say he secretly worked <laughs> for the government? I mean, and you know, how do you measure up to that? Yeah. And so there was for a long time. Now, the other side of that is I have never stepped behind a microphone and I didn't believe what I was going to say would save people's lives. Really? I did. I mean, I've never... You know, there was a period that you remember, maybe remember when we had six services. And people, how do you do that six times? I believe it. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I believe in what, I just, I truly believe every word I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and so it, that, that was some point replaced by that sense of, I can't wait to share this. Really? Whenever you talk about money or sex, people go, oh man. That's hard to talk about. Well, yeah, it is. I'd rather be talking about the calves than either one. <laughs> but I think there's truth here that can set people free. Yeah. So there's always also, no, it may not be as difficult as you think it is. Yeah. Uh, was there a point, because you've had, I can't even imagine the thousands of hours of reps. Mm -hmm. And this may be just selfish to me, but was there a point where the, it was just sheer excitement because it sounds like that's where you're at now. But but what was it like at the beginning part as you're getting you're getting on stage more? How did you become good at it? Did you feel like you had a natural gift for it at the beginning, or you really had to work at well, it? Well, both. Okay. Because I the the I didn't even think about public speaking until a speech class my third year of college when I had to give a three minute speech and wondered what am I going to talk about for three minutes? <laughs> and now you can't shut me up. <laughs> And something happened in that three minutes. Some, like people leaned in. And then, so there was that. Fast forward to 2011, I reached what I computed to be the 10,000 hours of preparation and delivery of messages. And I am a big believer in that rule because it, for me, since I hit that 10,000 hour mark, yeah. it's easier to prepare. It's easier to deliver. I used to teach 35, 40 times a year and I'd be worn out. I've been, te I mean, you know, I've taught yeah. a lot this year. Yep. I just, most days I'm speaking somewhere. I'm not tired. Really? I'm not. I mean, I, so the, I am a huge believer in, you know, I know you're writing the book and everything. You put that 10,000 hours in, 
I think there's something to that myself. Why, that was wait, for me. Why, why, why don't you have a book? You know, my, my, my daughter says it well. She says, Dad, because I do. I have so many book ideas. Well, I you've mean, probably I so written I know, but, 15 books. But I, I have, mean, seriously, if you I'm so, I am such a geek in that I have so many interests. I think I've told you, you know, like I have this whole workshop downstairs where I have recreated the all NFL decade teams in statues from the 1950s to the 1980s. So it took five years to do that, like down to the detail of the uniforms. I just love that. I love like if I have time, like today I have about two hours after we're done here before I got something else, I'll run home and I'll go down to my basement and uh, I'll, I'll tinker down there and that's, that's the time I should be writing. <laughs> well, you do write every week, though. You're I do, right, you I write do. Every week, so, so when I'm when I'm done with that, like I'm not even done with the sermon yet. I'll finish that tomorrow. But I just, I just want to create. You know, I just want to tinker. Because I do. I, I am. Yeah. I'm really. I'm strongly artistic. And and I, I. She said, Dad, you just have too many interests to write. And she meant that as a compliment because there's some truth to that. But on the other hand, there's so many mediocre Christian books. I don't want to put one more on the shelf. Yeah. So it's got to be something that I feel like. I think the world needs this. I think Russia needs, I mean, it's gotta be that, you know, they need this in Poland too, you know? What does it look like though? When you write a, when you write for the week, what is it a-, a So it's about 3,500 pages or words well, and season. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 do have, I do carve out time you to write 3,500 pages a week. Uh, you know, just in my spare time, I write this dissertation. Uh, uh, this is about 3,500 words and, you know, and then it's, it's on my laptop. I transpose it to my iPad or my iPhone and that's what I speak from. Or you know, or memorize from, and you know, you know um, I typically don't use notes very much. Yeah. Part of that is because I, I have the outline in my head of teaser, tension, truth, take home, and together, and and but that's you know that's usually done by noon on Friday. Yeah. So that we can get the slides and everything together. And then you deliver it three times. And then deliver it three times. Are you better the third time than the first time? I think so. Okay. I think so. A lot of people say, "Oh, I come on Saturday because I know it's going to be best on Saturday." Okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and think that, but it's better on Sunday because I knew I didn't work so well. Or yeah. a lot of times when I'm speaking, you know this, you think of something. Absolutely. It yeah. wasn't even in the notes. It's like, wow, that was a really good analogy. I'm putting that in for for Sunday. And yeah. I would. I two out of three weekends, I'll say to Will Scott, our tech guy, I'll say, hey, can you post sat Sunday at eleven thirty? As the video. As the week. video. I don't know what I'd do if I only did it one time. Why? What do you mean? Because I'm too much of a perfectionist in recovery to be satisfied with that. You I know? was going to ask you about that. So, like, I, I know when I, when I get done speaking, I, I'm trying to change this, but I think about the parts that I messed up, and I've never, oh. obviously, not messed up. And so, how do you? Are you hard oh, on yourself at the end? I or am what so you, hard. I don't sleep well on Saturday nights. Really? I don't because I ha I'm cursed with the five minute curse. You know what that is? I always go five minutes longer than I think I want to. You know, <laughs> so I'm always five minutes longer than I should be at least. And uh, then I just always that, oh, I forgot this. Or I got flippant and I got glib and I said something and Sherry said, don't say that tomorrow. Don't really? say that. To yeah. So she's the, she's the, she's the conscience. She's the angel on this shoulder going, don't. So do you do review like every Saturday night it was Sherry and you guys are having dinner? Not or by whatever. choice sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it just Not happened. by choice. But hey, Charlie, we have something to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I mentioned something last weekend on Saturday night and, and she's so, Miranda reminds me a lot of her. What a compliment. <laughs> yeah, she does. <laughs> but she, she always waits till Sunday, and we're, you know, we're having yeah. our tea on Sunday morning. See, by the way, <laughs> such and such thing, don't say that again. <laughs> and then, I, you know, because she knows that I am a master at self-condemnation. So I'm, I don't need someone to tell me how rotten I am at something. I pretty much will a, know that. A lot of times you will start and talk about like, I remember if it was, I don't remember what series, but that you'd like, gotten fights at a basketball game or yelled yeah, at the, the ref the and got kicked, got kicked out. Yeah. And like you're, you're really hard on yourself. And, and is that partially because like, I know everything is genuine, but sometimes like you're overly critical of yourself. Is that endearing to the crowd or I, why, I, why? I think it's, I think first it's natural to me. Kay. I came out of the womb that way, but then also, uh, psychologically it's a safety mechanism you know I think I think there's also a part of me that I've grown so much to receive negative feedback but I'm still not there yeah and sometimes I think in, in for us who are out in front 
if we self-criticize, we won't get as much criticism. Yeah. You know? You get in front of it. And yeah. And then I think it does connect with people. You know, it's our, you know, there's always that dynamic when you go in after a round of golf and you, you, you say, yeah, I sliced it on 17. Yeah, I sliced it on 17 too. Yeah. That we bond over that. So we right. bond over our out-of-bounds shots. We don't bond over, yeah. you know, hey, I've never had a hole in one. Yeah. Right. We don't yeah. bond over that because not very many people have had it. So <clears throat> there is a I mean, there it's, it's like anything. It's mixed with a genuine sense of I'm very aware of, of the inadequacies that are there. Yeah. Uh, I'm very I'm still not totally secure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. So it's a mix yeah. of those two. Yeah. One of the um, things you talked about, and I asked you like why you were meeting with me and I was because I'm grateful for you to invest time. Uh, when we have those one-on-one -on -one chats, and nobody knows you do it, and I know you don't broadcast that, and, you're, and I'm not the only one. There's probably like a line of people. Mm -hmm. There's always people before me, and I'm sure there are people after me when we go to meet. Yeah, but not very many people I got to watch play high school football, <laughs> and it was one of the best high school players I've ever seen. So there's a little <laughs> bit of a, you know, the <laughs> best interest in well, that. Well, I'm, I'm glad if it could be a win. We have a lot that's of comments. That's, okay. yeah, yeah. that's the deal. Um, but I know you're really passionate about developing future mm -hmm. leaders. That seems to be one of your yeah. number one goals in life, it feels like to me at this stage, is to develop the future leaders. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the test of leadership is your ability to reproduce yourself in others, in the parts that should be reproducible, right? And so, I, I told you, I've, I literally, 20 years ago, I remember 1996 when Ken Blanchard released his Situational Leadership Square of the S1, S2, S3, S4. Mm -hmm. And the path from direction to delegation, I literally had that in my wallet for 15 years, wore it out. Mm. I mean, it literally wore it out. Now I have it, it's on my phone. And I can say, hey, let's sit down and say, okay, Ryan, where do you feel like you are in this? And it's interesting because of the succession question you asked, that's, that's what I've always been trying to do. Like, if I don't succeed in succession, I will have failed in the very thing I've been trying to do for 26 years now, and that is, decentralized it can't you can't be a farmer you got to be a rancher who raises up other farmers mm -hmm. or else that the farm will just never have it'll get bigger than the chickens I mean that's, that's mm -hmm. it that's all it'll be so for me it's 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 those coffees mm -hmm. it's those uh, you know rounds of golf together it's the spending time story meeting strategy yeah yeah. You know, I, I can remember where I was standing in my mentor's kitchen when I was a college junior and he looked at me and said, I can't wait to see what God will do with your life. Mm -hmm. You talking to me? <laughs> and he saw something in me that I didn't see. So I've always just tried to, what, what, is, what is it they don't see in themselves? Yeah, yeah. Um, you, talk, you brought up athletics briefly and we both have that. Uh, I know you're a great basketball player. I was just listening to a podcast Ron Howard, the movie guy, actor, mm. uh, really talented, really well-spoken guy, was talking to Sam Jones on his show. It's a great show. And they were talking about why Wall Street people hire uh, former athletes. And they say, oh, probably because they're competitive and they win. And he said, no, 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 that's not why we like to hire athletes. We like to hire athletes because they lose so much mm. and they have to respond. And, I'm, and you have that in your background, I have it in the background and more. It really made me think, and I said, that's a great point. There's so many moments when you lose daily practice, obviously the games, yeah. it's in public. And so you've got, you, I, how has that impacted you as well as the leaders you worked with when it comes to the fact that you've lost, right? You've lost in athletics and that's probably made you better at what you do day to day. Well, there's, there, that is one of the most true statements ever made about leadership. Yeah. Because, first of all, I lose every day. Like, there, every day there's something that doesn't turn out the way you want it to. It, it doesn't get the response you want. And I don't, I was born without rear view mirror, so I can't, I don't, I don't look backwards. But I also don't see myself very well, very accurately. You, so, you, wait, hold on. So, you, are you not, you feel like you're not good at reflecting on? I'm not, I'm just not good at, I'm just not good at, I'm certainly not good at having an accurate understanding of myself. Right? Really? I'm not. I, Are you I, sure? I need people around, I'm not. I'm not. I need people around me. So for like, so you say, you know, when you, I believe you and, and I see the results of that I could have been, you know, a more, I could have been a, a popular speaker, let's say. Yeah. When I'm doing it, it feels that way. When I watch myself do it, which I have to do every week to evaluate, 
oh, that's not very good. Really? Yeah, I look at that and I go, wait a minute, that felt good when I was doing it, but it, yeah, so I, it's, it's, it's that, just, that it's just part, strange. That surprised me. me a little bit, just because, I like, I, I notice, I study the speaking part of what you do too, like mm -hmm. I, I go to be entertained for that as well, and every once in a while, like, you miss a tiny word, but that's about it. I mean, yeah, every well, once in a while. So I, I'm just wondering if you're I think, watching. I, I think it goes back to that just yeah. self-criticism. You know, yeah. I just don't yeah. see myself. Yeah, I just okay. don't see myself accurately. Yeah. But the, the, you know, I was, I was a world-class shooter. I mean, when I, when really? I played collegially, yeah. I mean, I shot 96% from the free throw line. The, wow. the, 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 you know, it's the same length as it is in the NBA and everything. You know, so I was, I was a, and I had tremendous range before the three-point play. So when I played, I played small college basketball, and, and, uh, and I, had a, I had never not shot double figures in a game ever in my career until the national semifinals my senior year. And uh, I was held to six points. Hmm. And a guy, a minister that I, a leader that I respected greatly, came up to me after the game and he goes, he goes, uh, I came from California to see you play, and I don't know why I came. And that, you know, he didn't mean it cruelly. He yeah. just, I think it was, but <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, you're but sure? he's like, so, you know, you, you know, and I, and I, and I, you know, it was such a gift because. It was just level set. You can score double figures in 102 straight games, and you mess up once, you're going to disappoint people. Yeah. You mean yeah. we won the game? I came back the next night and had a great game in the national final. We won the national championship. Thank God for yeah. that. But of all the things I experienced, and the 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 idea of I was a national player of the year. I was an All American at that level. That didn't help me in leadership as much as Dick Alexander saying to me, I don't know why I came all the way from California. Uh, you remember. We always, uh, that's what it, yeah, yeah we no matter remember, what you do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I vividly remember like throwing the pass against Cincinnati Elder. It got tipped. The guy I was at it. that game. Were you yeah, really? I was at that game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I feel it getting tipped, and then the guy having an easy yeah. catch and returning it for a touchdown yeah. and winning the game. And there was a lot of great plays that season, but I, I will never – forget that play and remember like absolutely you know and like slowly kind of jogging as the guy is running in the end zone thinking we just lost and we're the best team in the cut in the state and we just lost because of that play exactly and, it, right. and it was uh, it was it's just a it's a good thing to go through I think just like I, I've said this before losing the battle in college to Ben Roethlisberger to be the starting quarterback was a great great thing to go through no because question. it was high stress for two years uh, incredible competition in many even weird ways with a with a, a different type of a person who was just insanely talented and you're like I'm gonna do everything I can everything outwork him do whatever and the, and the coach says he's better than you yeah, but you're not good enough. he's better than you and, and you have to say he's right <laughs> yeah now, you, know? you lost out to a Hall of Famer you do I mean, understand right I mean that that's <laughs> made the story it's made the story a little better obviously yeah, yeah, but I mean yeah. but I mean yeah in the Ryan, moment I've never lost out to a Hall of Famer okay? <laughs> but it's but it's 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 good though it's good yeah, when you're 19 it is. 20 21 it to is. go through those types it of things it really is because I haven't really been in a, uh, a situation that stressful since where mm -hmm. it's in, but in, it's still a first world problem if you think about it. It is, like but, go it's through, but it's reality to character yeah. formation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you know grit is it is the yeah. only talent. Yeah. yeah. I remember going to the back to the hotel that night. Yeah. And I, I remember having a moment of, is this who I am? Yeah. You know, is, it yeah. was like it was gut check time. Am I? You said it. Am I going to get back up? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, Charlie, this is so good. I could go for hours, but. Um, for the listeners, we are doing this in the office of Brixie and Meyer. We have some great uh, team members here with us. I want to see if anybody had a question or two yeah, for Charlie yeah, to yeah. see if you, uh, and somebody's going to have to be the courageous one to go first. Greg is not in here. This he is why God says, put extroverts uh -oh, into the world. I right think here. I see the leader of the firm is in the corner. <laughs> 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 Doug or Terry. Or, um, I'll repeat it. Yeah. So I, can I guess see. what's your biggest challenge? Biggest challenge today? Figuring out a way to build a succession plan and not leaving too soon. It, 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 that's the biggest challenge I face. Um, I don't want to leave Southbrook high and dry, but I don't want to hang around too long. And so I, I live in that tension every day. Uh, and then the, the bigger, ch the, the, I'll be candid, 
is the ministry that I, the leadership I'm in, the ministry position is a character profession. One of my mentors has been released at his church after almost 40 years because of being accused of sexual misconduct. Wow. And that has rocked me. And I, it's just, I do not ever want to go out that way. I mean, that is, you know, that is my, my main goal is to be faithful to Sherry and faithful to the church and faithful to my community. And as small a world as I live in, I realize that if I were to mess up, it would, it would send shrapnel out that would affect a lot of people that I care about. And mm -hmm. so that's a big challenge, is just making sure leadership starts with self-leadership. The most yeah. important person I lead is myself, taking yeah. care of myself. Yeah. That means spending time in the basement making football players. That's what that means. <laughs> that's your hobby. The <laughs> that's my hobby. That's, Austin yeah, Cleon told me we all need hobbies. We Not do. something you don't we have do. to go sell it or do it, but we no. need a little And I could that. make, and like I made the top 100 Cleveland Browns of all time. No jokes here, okay? <laughs> uh, and and I, can, I can sell that. <laughs> yeah. Autogram. Autogram. <laughs> Baker Mayfield. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, hope hope. So. I hope so. <laughs> uh, but I could sell that for thousands of dollars. It's really good. Yeah. I don't. I just no. want something that's mine. Nobody yeah. evaluates it. <laughs> I go down to the basement and I look yeah. at it and go, that's really good. Yeah, yeah. And no, you know, it is. Yeah. You need a hobby that no one's evaluating, no one's uh, putting a, a price tag on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, any other questions, thoughts? I, you're sm Oh, go ahead. Um, so I know that you had the, the, um, the series of the stress breakers. And I'm just curious with the, when the church is so large and you can't Yeah. So how does it take a toll on you when you can't please everybody? That's a question. Leadership is the art of disappointing people at a rate they can handle. <laughs> it is. And most of us leaders are codependent when we go into it, but you will either die or heal of your codependency. Because mm -hmm. you cannot sustain trying to please people. And tr trust me, I've tried. And it goes back, Ryan, to that question about saying no. Every day I disappoint people. Every day I disappoint people. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I'm intuitive, so I read it. If people are mad at God and God has disappointed them, they're mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> so they project that. It's that imago deus. They project that. So, and not to, I mean, this is the first world problem for sure. But as a person who wants to be liked, everybody does, it, you, just, you better learn to manage that and heal from that need to please people or you are going to get fried. Mm-hmm. If you try to please everybody, you're, you're going to end up probably pleasing nobody. Pleasing nobody. Yeah. That's where your mission comes into play as a person, as an organization, because we say this is our eye on the ball. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Any other? Yeah. So the questions are on, a, on the importance of continued growth, having an apprentice in, in, in your process right. as a so leader. So what we, talk about, what we talked about Tuesday was the PB&J thing that I've come up with. You know, we all grew up on peanut butter and jelly. This is, in a, in a scriptural way, Paul, Barnabas, and Junior. It's Timothy, but it doesn't fit with PB&J if you say Timothy. PB&T just doesn't roll off the tongue like PB&J. And you've got to have people who are Paul. They're ahead of you, and they stretch you. They challenge you. Don't, st you know, we were talking about this with Coach Ullery. There were times where you didn't like him. Of course, yeah. Right? Yeah. But then you need Barnabases. These are people who are alongside you. They're your peers, and, and we're in this together, and, and, and we consolidate around our shared stories. But we also grow most when we have our juniors, the people that we're pouring into. Teach. Nobody grows like the teacher. Nobody grows like the leader. Yep. And so you... You know, people like that keep you on your toes because when you have that 360 degree influence around you, you can't fake it. Mm -hmm. You can't fake it. Yep. Somebody is going to spot you if you're living a disintegrated life. Mm -hmm. And so I've always had the blessing of tons of, of Barnabases, but just enough Pauls, and then of course more Timothys than, than probably I need. And that keeps me growing. The one thing about today, 
is if you don't keep growing, you're going to be in, irrelevant in about three years because the world is changing so fast. Mm -hmm. I am stunned mm -hmm. by how quickly it's changing. Mark talked about that in the, in the podcast recently, Mark Devine, that just the quick change, if you don't keep growing, yep. sayonara. Yep. One of the, the, the greatest ways I found to really understand your own beliefs is to teach. And Absolutely. that's why I bring it up. Doug and I have done a few leadership circles where, with his groups that are incredible, I'm doing with my own groups too, where we, I ask them for a specific topic that they feel like they either have mastered or have come close to mastery, that they would be willing to create a, pr a presentation and give yeah. a speech. The presentation doesn't matter, it's just the fact that they get up and they, and, and they can do it because if anything else, that forces you to really understand whatever, I don't even care about the topic. But uh, when we've gone through that exercise and people really think it could be putting together the Cleveland Browns or whatever it is for anybody, um, but, it, but it, it really uh, hammers at home. And I think the Philadelphia 76ers did that this year where they had each individual player. They said, look, you have to give a presentation. It's like, I think it was 10, 15 minutes. And it can be on anything you want. But yeah. you have to be a teacher for those yeah. 10 or 15 yeah. minutes, whether your hometown or somebody did it about tacos. I mean, anything you want. But it's just the fact of the practice of being a teacher is when you really it is a learn. Writing most. makes a person exact. Yep. So when yep. you write it and you have to speak it, you, yep. you, you, you know, if, it, if it's hazy in the podium, it's going to be foggy in the chair. Mm. You know? Yep. So you got to be specific. You, you can't be hazy. Yeah. Charlie, uh, Again, I could go forever, but I appreciate this. Uh, one, one more thing. So I, I used to ask it all the time, but I know you and I have talked about it. When you heard the, for the first time the phrase learning leader, what did that mean to you? Or what does that mean to you in the fact of uh, uh, when you first heard about the show? Well, two things. One is there is no other kind. Yep. And secondly, it also makes me reflect on our staff, would la they would laugh at the, that question because they've heard me say a thousand times, if you don't read, you can't lead. Mm -hmm. And then inevitably one of the staff who has a reading disorder or, you know, they, like they don't read real well, they'll say, well, but I'm not a good reader. If you can't listen, you can't lead. Then just get audible and <laughs> yeah. listen because, yeah. because there is no other leader than the learning leader yeah. and growing. And, you know, we share, you and I can talk about the books we read. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I was talking about story. Yeah. Amy Cuddy's book, Presence, is one of the most brilliant demonstrations of embracing your story. That's where your power, that's where your connection is going to happen. Do you think I read that book and didn't have any relevance to what I do? Oh, my gosh, it was so good. So I know you've read her stuff, and, and um, I, my mentor says psychology taught me about the scriptures. Scriptures taught me about psychology. He's a psychologist. And it's true about you know, reading those books. I, I, there's this truth there. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, for being here. Thanks everyone here. Yeah, uh, this is really cool yeah, to have like yeah, an audience fun. here. Yeah, it's really fun. Uh, it's been so much fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Ryan. Thank you. All right. Yep. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you.